Welcome everyone. So today I've been asked to talk about all things cyber security and it was an interesting request from our uh, friends at, at Connective Broker but before I go into it I want to share with you uh, a little bit of background on us and the work that we're doing uh, with Connective. Uh, so Loop Secure is uh, one of Australia's leading cybersecurity uh, firms. We've been around since the 80s doing this for quite a long time. And we've been working with Connective uh, for you know, a while now. And from our perspective, uh, we get to see a lot of companies around Australia. And in terms of Connective and their industry, they really are at the forefront when it comes to cybersecurity and maturity. And today they've asked uh, me to put together you know, a couple of slides that really can help you as the Connective member base um, with some actionable uh, cybersecurity uh, tasks that you can take away at the end of this session um, and, and use in your businesses. Um, from my perspective, you know, cybersecurity, it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, important in terms of businesses being aware of the risks. And in terms of the news, plenty of people are, are hearing about, uh, you know, all of the types of hacks and events that are going on um, today. So really in terms of the focus, the, the key takeaways I wanted to give uh, to you today is a bit of an overview of what the problem is. Um, and then really and importantly, what are some low or no cost uh, actions that you can take away at the end of this to improve your cyber security. And really for me, that's the key. I want uh, the members to be able to go back to the office after this session um, and st you know, straight away start to improve uh, your security. Interestingly enough, um, you know, this was a uh, cyber security breach that occurred uh, only last week. You may have seen it. Um, it was on the front page of The Age. Um, it's been all over the um, online websites across the country. Uh, but this was actually a, a family um, that were about to settle um, on a new property down in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. And uh, what happened was that the conveyancing firm that they used uh, to uh, settle the property were actually hacked um, and breached. And what that meant was that uh, the firm, which was Sergeant's Knox uh, Conveyancing, um, they had an, uh, used an application um, that allowed uh, them to settle uh, the property transfer electronically. And this conveyancer uh, unfortunately didn't take the steps necessary to protect uh, their cybersecurity. And so what happened, the hackers were able to get into this uh, online application, create new accounts, um, and then uh, transfer the entire deposit uh, that that family were going to use to settle the property of $250,000 uh, into their account. Um, so, you know, in terms of their reputation as a small business, as a conveyancer, um, you know, that's a big issue for them. And it really highlights that you know, the hackers are finding new ways and attacking new industries. And it's not just the big end of town uh, that they're going after. So to share with you just some statistics um, from the Australian government, this is something that I get asked about a lot. Uh, people think that, you know, uh, attackers are going after the big end of town. Well, you know, they are, but it is you know, crazy the amount of focus now on small businesses. About 43% um, you know, targeted in 2015. So this was even uh, you know, a few years back, uh, this particular stat. But when we dig into it, um, you know, further information that we see, 60% uh, of organisations that face um, a hack or a breach um, go out of business within the following six months, right? So, you know, these are the statistics. This is the issue um, that organisations are facing. And when we look at small businesses in particular, 22% um, that were breached by the 2017 ransomware attacks that occurred last year uh, couldn't continue operating, right? So, you know, it's a real issue what we're facing. Just in terms of some raw numbers, this is the amount of money um, that's being lost due to cybercrime. 
Um, and this is in Australia in 2017, right? So you can see this is, this is not a small uh, issue. My final slide on statistics. Uh, in terms of small businesses, and you know, if we look at the sub 100 uh, seat organisations, um, you know, 33 uh, percent, you know, are saying that they're not really taking proactive measures uh, when it comes to cyber security and, and trying to prevent cyber security breaches. Um, and then, you know, 87 percent at the same time uh, really believe that their business is safe, right? Because they're using things like antivirus. Well, I'm here to tell you that antivirus alone is not enough. And we're going to give you some takeaways that you can use uh, in order to, you know, address these risks. So, you know, when we talk about cyber attacks, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, um, but it is important to note some of the methods um, that the, the attackers are using out there. So, this is one you may have heard of, uh, email phishing, and essentially that's where um, you know, the attackers are trying to send you an email that's been crafted specifically for you, or it might be something that's a bit broader like the fake Australia Post emails that have been going around where they're saying you've got a, a package uh, to be picked up. Um, and they're, really the aim of that is for them to uh, you know, encourage you to click a link and then from there they can either steal your passwords or deploy malicious software onto your endpoint. So that's a really common um, method that's exploded in the last uh, couple of years. Malware uh, is the other category. And as I said, this can often be delivered through emails, um, but it can get in other ways through USBs um, as one example, or through other file sharing uh, systems like Dropbox. And, and really, the sky's the limit in, the ter in terms of what type of malicious software or malware uh, there is out there um, today. So I won't go into that in a huge amount of detail. Ransomware, I talked about that before. Uh, 2017 was a big year uh, from ransomware. This is a specific type of malware, uh, and it's designed uh, to basically encrypt and lock you out of your data. Um, and in order to get access back to the data, uh, they say that you need to pay a ransom and that they'll give you the decryption keys. Um, at least that's what they allege. Uh, the other is denial of service, so uh, this is relevant when uh, you know, the attackers use a number of computers that they take over and they are designed to send traffic um, to a specific target. That might be your website, it might just be your uh, particular business internet connection and the idea is to flood your network so that you can't conduct your normal business and you can't even get access to the internet or uh, your website goes down. And then finally, watering hole attack. And this is often used in conjunction with the email phishing, but essentially uh, what this is, is the attackers will copy websites that look legitimate. So they might copy Facebook, they might copy Google or Dropbox. And what they'll do is they will scrape all of the data that you enter into that website, collect that. So it's often used when uh, they're trying to get your credentials to online services. So it looks like you're entering it into the real uh, website, but you're actually not. Um, so these are some of the methods uh, that they use. There are many more, um, but all relevant to uh, you know, small businesses. Okay, so that's enough about the background. Um, from here, I, I wanted to really uh, move on to giving you some actionable takeaways around protecting yourself. So, in terms of basic uh, security measures, I just want to walk through uh, a, a few of these. Now, we've also got a checklist uh, that we're going to send out uh, following this webinar, um, but I'll walk you through these and give you a bit of an example as to why uh, they're important. I mentioned malware before um, as uh, one of the attack methods. Often what malware is trying to do is exploit uh, you know, weaknesses in your applications or your operating systems. 
And these weaknesses uh, are called vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities are regularly patched by um, the operating system vendors like Microsoft or Apple um, or Adobe um, in terms of application vendors. But the, this is one of the key things that you have to do. And it's a very easy thing for you to do as a small business because if you're regularly patching your environment, then it just means that there's a much lower risk of malware being able to be destructive. Things like that ransomware uh, that we talked about. So we encourage to turn on uh, automated patching. A lot of the systems like Apple allow you to just click that, yes, I'm happy for there to be automated patches that are downloaded and installed onto uh, my device, so I don't even need to think about it. You know, for those that don't have automated patching, it's just getting into the habit of really downloading those. And, and it's not just about, you know, your phone or your computer. Um, in terms of the operating system. It's also things like browser plugins. And, and really these are things that if you use Chrome or you use Safari or Internet Explorer uh, to navigate the web, then there are plugins in the toolbar that you may have downloaded to do uh, different tasks. You need to update them as well because they're often uh, used. So, sorry, Belinda. Sorry, Patty. Can you explain what patching is for those who don't know? Yes, no worries. So Belinda asked uh, for me to explain what patching is for those who don't know. So patching is where essentially you are downloading a software. It's otherwise known as software updates. Uh, so for most of you, if you're used to having an, a, a phone from Apple or an Android phone, you'll notice that there are software updates that come out and you need to download and install those software updates. What essentially those updates are doing are bringing new functionality, new features, but most of the time they're also um, getting rid of security vulnerabilities, um, which are in effect uh, vulnerabilities in the software that allow attackers to get in. So these software updates are not just for your iPhone, and not just for your Android, they're also for applications you use. You might use Microsoft Word. You might use Microsoft Outlook. When was the last time you went to the top right, help and check for updates? If you haven't done that, um, this is something you need to do uh, regularly. The second um, of the basics, and look, that first, it doesn't cost you anything to do that, right? Um, so that, was some, that is something that we encourage. The second is what's known as uh, multi-factor uh, authentication. You might have heard of it as two-factor. You might have heard of it as two-step authentication. Um, if you use Facebook, uh, they talk about two-step. Um, but essentially what this is, is not just relying when you're logging into an application on your username and password. Username and password, that's single factor. The only factor is the password. That's the one item that you need to know. What two-factor does is it goes a step further. It says, we want you to know your password, but there also has to be a second uh, factor in there that you need to provide to prove who you are. And often that second factor, it might be uh, in the form of an SMS. So we're used to that with uh, our internet banking. Um, so a lot of uh, the, the banks now, when you need to make a new transfer to someone that you, hasn't been in your address book, uh, they might ask you to um, enter a code that they've sent to you via SMS. That's two-factor authentication. Um, and that two-factor authentication is widely uh, available now across many um, applications that you use. Today, uh, many of you might use services like QuickBooks online as an example, um, you know, this is an application that has the ability to turn on uh, this two-factor authentication. Um, interestingly enough, uh, for those of you who are Connective members um, and that use the Mercury platform, uh, Connective also offer two-step uh, authentication. So this is something that I strongly recommend that you put on um, and turn on within your Mercury platform. And you can certainly reach out uh, to Belinda and the team at, at Connective. Um, if you want to know uh, any details, just send a note to the Mercury Help Desk. They'll give you all the instructions on, uh, 
on how to go about turning on uh, that particular multi-factor authentication. So that's number two. The majority, I'd say 90% of the time, this is no additional cost, right? But it is something that you should be setting up. And it's not just about your business accounts, it's about your personal accounts too. If you use Twitter, if you use Facebook, if you use Instagram, these are services you should be looking at um, setting up the two-step authentication on to protect your family, to protect yourselves uh, at home. In a lot of cases, two-step authentication may not uh, be possible. Um, and we all know how many passwords each of us have. It's like every week you get asked to sign up to a new service online. Um, I, at last count, probably had about 400 uh, different accounts online. It's scary. Um, and what I use uh, at home is a password vault, right? And essentially what a password vault is, is it's a system, an application, that stores all of your passwords uh, to all of the applications. So in my case, I've got 400 passwords in there. But you can also use it to generate you know, really complex, really strong passwords randomly. And because you don't have to remember those passwords anymore, you can have passwords that are 20, 30, 40 characters long, super complex, and the systems will enable you to copy that password so that when you're logging in, you know, you can do it much more easily. You don't have to constantly remember, uh, you know, what was the password um, for, for that particular system. Belinda, you had a question? How safe are password vaults? Can they be hacked? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the question was how safe uh, password vaults, can they be hacked? And they certainly can. Um, and there's no such thing as, as you know, a foolproof uh, system when it comes to security. Um, but as with any type of tool, there are differences and different systems out there. So um, the particular tool that, that I use um, at, at home is called LastPass. Um, but there are a few out there, and the ones that are, are, I suppose, better in terms of their security, what they do is they encrypt the data um, and the passwords before it even gets to them. So no one at that particular password vault company could ever get access to your passwords because they don't have uh, the password or the key to get into your vault. So it's critical that um, you know, you do your research and, and, and look at what options are available, but certainly, um, from my perspective, they're pretty safe. Um, that's why I use them. It's a hell of a lot safer to use a password manager um, to manage all of your passwords than writing them down or trying to remember or using the same passwords because what often happens is people use the same password across multiple systems, and the issue there is that once one system gets hacked, um, and they get hacked all the time, uh, you know, Adobe was hacked a few years ago, once the hackers get the password that you use for Adobe, if you're reusing that on other services, then bang, they've got your username, they've got your password, they can then log in to these other systems. If you accidentally um, fall for one of those phishing emails, which is easy to do. Some of them are, you know, are very good, these phishing emails. You enter in your password and your username, suddenly they've got it. If you're reusing it across multiple sites, that's a far bigger um, security risk than the risk of your vault um, being um, attacked. You know, there, there are some things you, you may not want to put in there, like, for example, your internet banking passwords for example, but for the great unwashed of the other hundreds of <laughs> passwords, I certainly recommend to use a password uh, vault. And interestingly enough, with the password vaults, you can enable two-step authentication. And if you're going to use a password vault, absolutely um, secure it with, with this two-step. I use Google Authenticator because it's free. Um, the next uh, recommendation is around uh, endpoint security. So for your laptops, if you've got servers, um, etc., is to install uh, antivirus software um, and keep it up to date. This is really one of the, the basic fundamental 
um, elements of, of cybersecurity and you know, a good antivirus um, software package you know, will really take care of a lot of uh, those malware uh, applications that are out there. You know, it's, it's not going to protect you against everything, um, but it's much better to have this on um, and protecting you than, than not. Uh, so this is something that we also uh, recommend. Can, can you recommend any specific antivirus software? software? Um, look, you know, really, uh, I could recommend a couple. However, the, the question was, can I recommend antivirus software? There are a few good ones out there. You know, McAfee is, is quite good, Symantec. Um, so FOSS, basically there's a lot of uh, leaders um, in the space and I think again it's one of those um, areas that it would be difficult for me to provide you know a recommendation on that but if you do your research um, you know you'll be able to see um, a lot of good providers out there. The key is to just use one of them, any of them, uh, rather than getting down to the nitty gritty of, of what's better. Um, because you know, one day one of them might be better, the next week the other one is. Um, so as long as you're aware it's not a silver bullet, um, there, are th you know, there are some good options out there. Um, but you know, there's also some dodgy ones, so you've got to be careful uh, because there's companies that are you know, doing fake antivirus software. Um, so typically, you know, it's like anything, you get what you pay for. So if it seems too good to be true, um, in terms of cheap antivirus, well, just be careful because it could be something that's a little bit more malicious um, that's actually designed to take your data rather than help you protect. And look, you know, this is something that in terms of AV, if, if there are organisations that are wanting assistance, you know, certainly reach out to the Mercury Help Desk and you know, they can provide some advice on, you know, for example, the type of antivirus software that we work with Connective on, on providing them. Um, it's not something I'm comfortable sharing with you know, publicly, but I'm sure if you get in touch, uh, the Connective team can provide a little bit more of a specific uh, recommendation to you. Finally, in terms of the basics, uh, backups, right? Um, and so this is something that uh, often you don't think of doing until it's too late. So we looked back um, at the statistics around the percentage of organisations that just don't recover uh, from you know, a malware attack around uh, ransomware last year. I think it was 22% um, that just didn't, weren't able to recover. And the key to protecting yourself against that is if you have a backup um, of your data and then someone is able to encrypt it and hold you to ransom, well then at least you can restore your data uh, from that backup without having to pay uh, the ransom. So this is something that's just crucial um, and, and good practice regardless of cyber security, you know, IT systems and laptops get lost, um, you know, they might crash um, and die. Um, in terms of the device, so you know, having backups and having regular backups are um, important. We'll also provide some details um, to the Connective team on you know, what are the type of best practices in terms of how you can set up backups, but again, this should be low to no cost in terms of being able to get this um, done you know, within your organisation. So those were some of the, um, the basics. Then, I, you know, there's additional measures. Um, it's not that I wouldn't call these basics. Um, I certainly wouldn't necessarily say they're advanced. I think that these are uh, measures that you could absolutely um, use uh, in your organisation. And if you do these things as well, you're going to really increase uh, your maturity and be at the leading edge in terms of small uh, businesses. So. Um, it's that human element within your staff, right? So the phishing emails, they're getting more sophisticated, but I, I think this is a key area, being able to train um, the staff and being able to talk openly about helping them to identify, you know, what does a phishing email look like? Um, have that culture in your environment where it's okay um, for your staff to 
question or ask, hey, is this, a, is this a phishing email? This shouldn't be something that we're ridiculing people because they didn't spot the phishing email. Some of this stuff is, is pretty good. And look, we do phishing attacks where we'll um, be paid by companies to come in and fish their employees. And I can tell you from the stats, you know, it's crazy the amount of people that not only click on the emails that we develop these fake emails, but actually give us their credentials to their company. Right? The percentages are, are huge. So being able to be open and have the discussion and have an environment where they're happy to come to you and say, hey, is this a phishing email or not, um, is, is something that's really important because that's the main, one of the main areas that attackers are getting in. Sure, so the question was, uh, can I give some tips on how to identify a phishing email? Um, happy to share um, following this, you know, some of those tips in a little bit of um, detail, but there are generally, um, you know, some common uh, telltale signs. The number one element is um, the email address uh, itself. So what will often happen is that the attacker will um, try and uh, spoof, which is um, otherwise known as in, impersonate someone else. So the, they might take someone else in your organisation that's on your website, maybe your CFO, one of your founders, whatever. They'll get that person's name and they'll put that name in the first name and last name field of their email client so that when they're sending it to you, it comes up as Joe Bloggs, uh, the founder. It doesn't show you the email address, it just shows you the name. So Forgetting the rest of the element of the email, if you actually go and click on that name and go and see what is the email address uh, un underpinning and behind that, often that will be the giveaway. It will be some sort of Gmail account. It won't be that person's email address. If it's coming from a company like Australia Post, often what the attackers will do is they'll register a domain name um, that's very close. Uh, to Australia Post. So um, it might be Australia Post but with the number one instead of I. So it looks like it's Australia Post but it's not. Right? So you, you actually need to check and just take a bit more care and, and generally if you can spend the time, uh, you know, when you receive an email, even if you're somewhat uncertain, it's always better just to at that point um, check those elements. We'll give you some more tips uh, following up on this, but that's a common way that you can, um, you can address um, that issue. Uh, the other one that I um, think is, is an easy way to f um, try and address these issues is if you create a rule in your email system um, to, you know, you can create rules to move automatically emails into certain folders. So, for example, you might want to uh, take your email address, what they call as the domain name, so it might be at connective.com.au. Uh, so you go anything that ends with at connective.com.au, I'm going to move that into a folder called internal email, right? And everything else we know didn't match because often what the attackers are trying to do is impersonate someone else in your organisation. So that's a simple uh, way of, of trying to deal with that because you just know if someone is uh, purporting to be someone else in your organisation that goes into this other email folder, well, you know it's not them. So another measure you can take is around uh, what they call web uh, security and email uh, security, so web and email filtering. Again, there's a lot of tools um, out there, um, happy to you know, share after you know if you if you guys want recommendations, um, but this is something that um, is definitely worthwhile um, as an additional layer. And, and basically, these web and email filters are designed to automatically keep up to date lists of known bad websites. Um, they keep up to date lists of bad attackers that are sending emails trying to do phishing. And often, you know, by using these, you'll help to avoid going to bad websites, dodgy websites, and you should be able to remove a lot of those spam or phishing messages. Um, again, this is not perfect. 
it's, it's going to help you know, considerably, but things are still going to get through. So it's just another layer um, that you can use. This one's no cost. You should be doing it. Um, disk encryption um, for laptops. Um, this is something that if you've got a Windows, Microsoft Windows laptop, they include it. It's called Microsoft BitLocker. Uh, if you've got a Mac, uh, then it's called Apple File Vault. And again, you can, if you turn that on, it means that the, the, they encrypt your entire hard drive so that if you lose your laptop um, and someone else picks it up and wants to get in, there's no way they can get access to that data uh, without the encryption keys which you hold uh, the encryption keys. So that's a big one um, to, to do. Um, USBs, uh, unless you've got a mighty fine uh, reason to use USBs in your organisation, I'd be recommending against using them. Um, and the reason is that they're just so easy to lose. They're also a, a really common uh, mechanism for, you know, basically malware coming into your environment. Right, so um, USBs are a, a big vector by which attackers uh, get in uh, to organisations. So even forgetting about the fact that you know the potential data loss issues if you lose one of your USBs, if you have to use them, I'd recommend buying an encrypted uh, USB. That means that you have to put a password in to be able to access the contents of the USB. The final one here is, is more around a process. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. Um, I'd be reviewing user accounts to your critical systems. Um, so for example, uh, your accounting package you know, is a good idea to actually log in and see you know, as who are the other people that have got accounts uh, to this system. Because the common thing that uh, attackers try to do is set themselves up with accounts in, in your critical system. So just by reviewing that, it can obviously tell you whether you've had a compromise or not. It could be um, also an employee leaves your organisation and you forget to deactivate them within the system, right? That's another um, common one. So you know, what you can do here is in your offboarding process, just have another check that when we um, have an offboarding of an employee, we're going to go into these applications and make sure that we've removed them um, at, from an account. Final slide uh, for you today in terms of some additional measures. And as I said, I really wanted the focus of this session to be about giving you some takeaways and, and some low to no cost uh, measures that you can uh, use in your business. So. This is, uh, apologies if it's a, a deluge of recommendations, but this is the final uh, piece of those. I talked about reviewing who has access to your applications, but you know, even better than that is just not giving out access if you don't have to. You know, it's really important. If you can limit uh, you know, who has access within your organisation uh, to what sensitive information, it just makes life um, a lot easier in terms of securing your environment. And you know, you don't want to go crazy, obviously sp people still have to do their job, um, but it, some, some organisations get a little bit carried away and everyone has access to everything, which is not a good idea. This is a recommendation that you would need to speak to your bank about. Um, and as opposed to what I talked about earlier around two-step uh, authentication in terms of your logins and using those uh, SMS part one time passwords and the like. This is around um, if you've got a business account with one of your banks, what the process is before you can transfer uh, money, right? And, and I always recommend, especially if you've got multiple people in your organisation like a couple of founders or you know, a CFO or a finance manager and um, one of the owners of the business, try and identify two people that both have to approve um, a transfer or a, or a transaction. It can be over a certain amount that you do this. Have a chat to your bank. They'll, they'll have some advice on this, but you know, often one of the things that um, the attackers will do is they might send a dodgy invoice 
to you for payment, right? And the invoice looks real, it looks like something that should be paid, and that's a big way that people are, you know, the, the, the person that's responsible for the banking transfers logs in, maybe they're rushing, they make the transfer, right? So having a second set of approvals is just another set of eyes um, to make sure that, um, you know, there's a double check. The other thing is, if for whatever reason, uh, the person who's the primary account holder for that bank was breached and someone had their credentials or, you know, were able to get in, then it makes it a lot harder because they've got to actually do that for two people. So this is a big one that's, again, no cost, pretty easy to do and I strongly recommend um, to get that set up. Um, then it's down to really people and process. So the last three are um, some other measures that you can do. Um, as with anything, if there's not someone responsible or accountable um, within your organisation for a particular project, then it can um, just fall by the wayside. So I always recommend have someone that you anoint as being responsible for cyber security. Right? It can be anyone, you can give them the, this checklist and the things that you uh, want to do. It doesn't need to necessarily be someone who's IT uh, savvy. It can be anyone in the business. Just make sure you've got someone that is responsible uh, for security. Um, it helps if they're um, you know, someone in a management uh, position that has access um, to you know, your key systems. The other element is what we call uh, incident response plan. Essentially what this is, is think about the scenario where tomorrow, you know, there is a ransomware, all your data is encrypted, you can't get access to it. What would that mean for your business? So it's just walking through and doing a bit of a scenario. Um, it's much better to do this planning ahead of time than when you have a particular incident. As I said, all of these, these measures are not necessarily going to guarantee that you can stop um, a security issue from arising. So the sort of the last line of defence, if you like, is how well are you going to respond if there is an incident? You know, if you've got customers, are you going to be notifying them? You know, how are you going to be notifying? Is it the owner of the business? Is it someone else? Do you need to get legally involved? Um, do you need to speak to your insurance firm, right? There's a lot of things that um, you need to think about uh, when it comes to responding to a breach. Um, but actually going through the process um, of pretending you've had one and working out what you're going to do and documenting that and assigning responsibilities is a really, uh, really positive step um, that you can take um, as an organisation. And then really the fi final piece um, is around just documenting some, some policies um, and processes. You know, a big one is around acceptable use, right? Um, having somewhere that's written down that says, hey, here's what the staff uh, in our company you know, are allowed to do. Here's what we think is acceptable when they're accessing our data, when they're using the internet, using our systems. And this is not about being draconian and stopping people from doing their work or it being some big complex document. It's about keeping it simple so that people know what's accepted um, and what's not. You know, for example, I talked about if you wanted to limit USBs, well, having that in a document says, hey, in our company, we really don't want to use USBs. So if you need to, you need to get approval from XYZ. So these are the types of things that you want to put uh, in your policies and processes, and there's a whole lot of you know, solid policies, process examples on the internet that you can get um, and we can share some links so that at least you can get started on that front. So that is really um, it in terms of recommendations. There's a lot of things that you can do um, in, in cyber security. You know, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of security measures out there for every type of, of use case. What I tried to do here is summarise some of the things that are going to be um, pretty cheap um, or free uh, for you to do and that are going to improve your security as a small business. Um, so whether you've got one person in your company or you've got a hundred, you know, these are all things that you can do uh, to limit your exposure. So uh, before we wrap up, I suppose any questions from, from anyone? 
how safe, safe is cloud storage? So the question was how safe is cloud storage? Uh, and the answer is depending on the cloud storage vendor uh, that you go with, um, it can be quite safe. Um, if you think about it, for example, Apple, they offer uh, cloud storage, Microsoft, Dropbox. Now, you know, these are large firms, they spend a lot of money on security. And I said before that not, there's no guarantee uh, that any organisation will not be hacked and there can be issues um, with, with these firms that I just mentioned, but they've got a lot more resources and they're spending a lot more money on security than what most small businesses uh, can. So, you know, we strongly recommend as a small business to, to leverage cloud services where possible um, because it just means you're getting access to all of that security that those uh, providers use. For example, Connective, you know, spend a significant amount of money on, on cyber security. Um, and so you get access to that um, as part of your cloud service. So I'd highly recommend that. But as with anything, it's, you've got to do your due diligence because there's a lot of dodgy operators out there. Um, and that's the same for cloud services, right? There's some cloud services that are, that are not, very, uh, not very wholesome. So, uh, but I'd, I'd recommend looking at some of the big ones, you know, Apple, Microsoft, um, you know, are two places to start that I think are really robust um, you know, in terms of options. Okay, so the question was, do I recommend using external hard drives uh, if I don't recommend using USBs? Now, uh, I suppose when I talk about USBs, uh, it's just one type of external storage device. So really, it applies to all type of external uh, storage that's in a physical uh, system. You know, the USBs are particularly bad because if you take them with you when you're travelling and you lose them, they're much more portable, um, so the risk is higher. If you've got a hard drive um, that's in your office that you're using uh, to do backups, um, what I would, uh, I would recommend looking at a cloud-based storage primarily um, because the issue with that is that you've got all your data on a portable device. And again, you know, if the cleaner comes in, throws it out, um, someone like within your company goes a little bit rogue and decides they want to come after you. I know it's unlikely, but these things happen, right, in terms of, uh, you know, having all your crown jewels on, on a portable device. I just wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it. If you have to, then when you're finished with your backup or whatever it is you're doing with that device, I'd be storing it in some sort of secure, you know, physically secure area with a lock and key. Um, do you think cybersecurity liability insurance is necessary? Uh, so the question was, do I think cybersecurity liability insurance is necessary? I think it's an area that is rapidly changing uh, and it's, it's not something that I can answer for you um, because everyone's different in terms of the way they leverage technology, um, the types of data and customers that they have. What I recommend is talk to your uh, lawyer, right, about, you know, um, whether you would get value. In a lot of cases, um, absolutely, there's value in having uh, cybersecurity insurance, but as with all insurance, it's all about the exclusions, right? So it's, it's great to think that you've got insurance, but if you can't claim because there's some exclusion in the policy, um, then you're gonna have a very bad day. And when I talked about the fact that insurance in cybersecurity is new, um, unfortunately, it's a little bit like the Wild West. There's some good policies out there, but there's a lot of bad ones and it's not mature. Um, so there's a risk that you get it, you think you're covered, uh, but that when it, then when it comes to trying to claim on it, um, you can't. So that's where having someone that's more of a legal background that can advise you, um, you know, the propensity 
of that uh, insurance cover to actually cover you and be redeemable. I think that's you know pretty important. And and the the legal um, practitioner will be able to tell you you know about your obligations with the data and um, whether or not that falls under. Um, I suppose some of those regulations that are out there around the privacy breach legislation um, that came out, uh, you know, recently. Um, last question: do, do you think a Mac is more secure than a PC? Do I think a Mac? The question was: Do I think a Mac is more secure than a PC? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a I'm a Mac user, um, and you know I unashamedly you know do believe believe that. Um, the reality is that uh, Windows machines are far more widely used, uh, especially in businesses, large businesses. Um, I don't know the latest percentages, but it's well over probably 60, 70 percent of companies use Windows and it's big companies, so therefore attackers are trying to find holes in those machines. But Macs have been more popular over the last five years. They're starting to creep up in terms of the market share and how many people are using it. So there are a lot more um, targeted attacks that are coming after Macs. So just because you have a Mac doesn't mean uh, you're immune. Um, but yeah, certainly from, from my perspective, I think that they're um, you know, more secure. So um, as a small business, um, I'd be recommending to go that way if you can afford it. They're a little bit more expensive, but yeah, I'm a bit of an Apple fanboy, so wrong person to ask. Okay, thanks guys.